the small intestine has three main sections that we will discuss. You need to know the part. So the duodenum is the first section. It has a couple of jobs. It first receives the processed food from the stomach. What is that food called? Yes. And it's, what is the pH of that food or that chyme? Very acidic. It's like battery acid acidic. So we're looking at a pH of about two to three. Really, really acidic. So the duodenum has to have some mechanism to handle that high acidity and bring it back up to a normal pH. So we'll talk about the bicarbonate production from the Brunner's glands. Also, when chyme arrives into the duodenum, this is where all three of our macronutrients are going to be digested. Fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. We got a head start on the carbohydrates in the mouth by salivary amylase. We got a heart head start on the proteins in the stomach by the activated pepsin. So now we can not only digest fats, mechanical and chemical digestion of fats, we can continue our digestion of carbohydrates and continue and finalize our digestion of proteins here in the duodenum. So it's a lot that takes place there. So it's receiving a lot of secretions. It's having to buffer acidity. Once the food gets through the duodenum and enters the jejunum, it's really all about absorption. So the jejunum is gonna have really long villi to increase surface area so we could maximize just absorbing what has now been broken down. Then we get all the way through to the ileum. A lot of the food has been absorbed. We can continue to absorb through the ileum, but now it's a little more cleared out so the ileum with the pyres patches can inspect, so to speak, the food that's in. Are there antigens present and so on? So we have a lot of our immune system interface going on there in the ileum. Also in the ileum, we're gonna learn is where a vitamin B12 is going to be absorbed if it's connected with intrinsic factor. Of, through all of these three sections, these are some of the components that you're going to see. So there is an immense amount of surface area, meaning just by having folds, it allows us to have more surface available to interface with the food so we could maximize absorption. So there's these things called plicae circularis. It is like rugae in the stomach in that it's, there are these folds. So I'll use this kind of this cloth as an example. So if we have this cloth out, we roll it up and make it into a tube. You can see how long that would be. So this would be a tube. This is like maybe a section of an intestine. But if we were to put some folds in it, some orderly folds like this, You can see where there's folds that are put in it. Now we make this into its circle. You can see how it's a lot shorter distance than it originally was. So you can see though, we have that same amount of surface area now stacked into a shorter distance of the tube. So if we have these folds, they're pleats. So plique circularis, it's going around a circle, those are the folds, like rolling hills, but in a more regular fashion than we saw the rugae in the stomach. So these plicae circularis folds allow for a dramatic increase in surface area. Now we'll pull this back out. Um, and because if we look at the cloth, you guys don't have it in front of you and the video people certainly don't, but on the cloth, we see tiny bits of fabric or ends of string, so to speak, that stick out like little tufts. If you can imagine each of these little tufts as being a villi. So we would have these folds as a plique circularis, but little villi are still sticking off of them. And so those are the little finger-like projections that we will see when we look at the histology slides of these areas. At the ends of the villi are little brush border enzymes in that we have some enzymes that will just do cleaving of two, like so the carbohydrates. So we may have two molecules together, just cleaves the last two, a couple of amino acids together, it'll cleave those off. They're not contributing a significant amount to digestion, but they are contributing sort of like a final little cut before they 
cross the simple columnar cells and actually enter our bloodstream at that point. Lacteals, who can remember what lacteals are? They absorb fat, excellent. They're a modification of our lymphatic system and they're specific to the gut and they allow for flat, fat to absorb. So fat goes into lacteals, carbohydrates and proteins, broken down carbohydrates and proteins will go into the bloodstream. In this picture, you can see the stomach is lifted up. That's why it's shaped weird. So imagine someone lifting the stomach up so that we can see the pancreas below it. But mainly I want you to notice, mainly I want you to notice this C-shaped structure and that's the duodenum. So it fits, the head of the duodenum here fits nicely around the pancreas because the pancreas is going to be contributing the majority of the digestive enzymes into the duodenum so we can finish off digesting carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Then beyond that would then be the jejunum, and then beyond that would be then the ileum. So we would have the jejunum in this first portion, and then the ileum would be in this terminal portion. This is a better schematic regarding the small intestine and the plique circularis. So this would be one of those folds, that's a plique circularis, and then each of these little guys sticking up would be the villi. You can see they're a lot more numerous in this bottom image show. So it's the top image, you can see that there's fold after fold after fold. And that's what's gonna give us a huge amount of surface area. Here's some examples of plique circularis in the duodenum as well as in the jejunum. When we look down at a smaller scale, we're gonna look at just the villi. We can see many villi here. This makes up, this here would make up the mucosa layer. Then we have the submucosa layer below in this purple area. And then we have muscularis externa as the bottom two layers. The outermost layer being the longitudinal muscle and the layer just in from that is going to be the circular uh, muscle. Over to the side, we can see a single villa. So if we do one villa, we can see that right here. What you have around the edges will be simple columnar epithelial cells. That type of epithelial tissue allows for us to have one cell layer thick between where the food is and inside where our blood is and our lacteals are. So one cell layer thick for maximal absorption, but we don't want it so wafer thin like in the lungs with the air and sort of diffuse many things. We want to have a compromise. We want one cell layer thick so we can absorb things easily, but it's going to be a big cell so that we can allow for some distance and some protection. So it's a compromise. One cell layer thick to maximize what we want to bring in, but it's a big cell so we can try to keep out as much as we can from this. So that's why those are simple columnar epithelial cells and that's gonna be the hallmark throughout the entire small intestine. So once food gets across the simple columnar epithelial cells, then the carbohydrates and the proteins, the broken down ones, will go into the capillaries and the fats will go directly into the lacteals. We can see the lacteal here, right in the center portion. Who can tell me where the blood goes when it's leaving these villi? They've absorbed the proteins, absorbed the carbohydrates. Toward the liver, what vessel? Hepatic portal vein, excellent. Nice job. So look up close, this is the histology of the villi. We can see there's some goblet cells. We'll have loads of goblet cells as we travel through um, our GI tract, help maintain lubrication, keep food going forward. The duodenum is just the first 12 inches or so to speak. It's just a very small section. It's this C-shaped section that cups around the head of the pancreas. It receives the chyme directly from the stomach. The duodenum also receives bile from the gallbladder. The gallbladder is going to release bile in the presence of a fat and it goes down through the common bile duct and will enter the duodenum that way. It also receives pancreatic secretions. So the pancreas is going to make enzymes that will digest carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and those will travel down that pancreatic duct and also enter the duodenum.
The duodenum has a very unique set of glands, the Brunner's glands secrete bicarbonate. Who can tell me what the purpose of bicarbonate would be? It neutralizes, so it would be a buffer, neutralizing acid. As soon as this very acidic chyme enters the duodenum, Brunner's glands get to work, secreting bicarbonate, neutralizes it, and brings that pH back up to a moderate pH. At that point, however, this is a topic that we'll have in the next class session, it will neutralize and deactivate the pepsin. So the pepsin is not doing its job anymore from the stomach, because pepsin, remember, becomes only active at really low pH levels. Okay, so Brunner's glands is there to neutralize the acid coming from the stomach. Because that deactivates the pepsin, protein digestion ceases until the pancreas releases its own protein digestive enzymes, which then function at a neutral pH. That's what we're gonna learn about on Monday. So here's the histology. We really wanna make note of these Brunner's glands. So the normal histology of the small intestine are these villi, these finger-like projections, the edges of the villi will have simple columnar epithelial cells. You got that there, there'll be some goblet cells in there. And then you can see our four main layers. Again, that's what we went over last class session. We wanna be able to break everything down, all our histology slides into our four main layers if they're visible. You can see more closely the submucosa, which normally is just connective tissue. This submucosa has Brunner's glands. That's where the bicarbonate is going to come from. That's where the bicarbonate's made. Then we have the muscularis externa, circular muscle, and longitudinal muscle. Here's a different histology image of the duodenum. We can see the mucosa is this distance. So this line that I'm drawing in blue, it's going right through muscularis mucosa. So there is a the mucosal layer, is this layer, includes not only epithelial cells, but a tiny thin layer of muscle as well. But that muscularis mucosa provides a really nice boundary between we're at the end of mucosa and now everything beneath is gonna be submucosa. So they call them submucosal glands, which we will call them Brunner's glands. This is another histology image. You can see again, the villi off to this side to the right then this really wide submucosa, much, much wider than we see anywhere else. And it's filled with all these circular gland formation and then a thinner um, muscularis externa on the other side. The jejunum, however, you can see in this picture a little bit where we get to the bottom of the mucosa, then we have muscularis externa. The submucosa is really just this wispy thin area. Well, there's nothing in there but connective tissue. So you can really notice the absence of the Brunner's glands here. The other main feature for the jejunum, because its job is mostly absorption, we wanna have long villi. The longer the villi, the greater the surface area. So the histology of the jejunum is this. Again, we can see how thin the wall is. No Brunner's glands, just a bunch of vessels and connective tissue. We have villi, it's gonna have simple columnar epithelial tissue, submucosa, and again, our muscularis externa. I'll pull this out, we can see it in more detail. Again, you can no notice the contrast with the duodenum. Here are the two together. Who can tell me which side is the duodenum and which side is the jejunum? The duodenum is on the right, yep, and the jejunum is on the left. So let's look at this a little more closely. So we can see the duodenum and the jejunum. You can see the, on the far right, the muscle cells were really only seeing the circular portion because the other part is sort of beyond the screen image where both of them are together here. So really the wall on the duodenum is a lot thicker just because we have way more taken up by what would be the submucosa. And you can see it's just filled with those glands. We can see endoscopically what the duodenum versus the jejunum looks like. The ileum is the last portion or terminal portion of the small intestine. Most of the lymphatic tissue is gonna be here. It's known as GALT. Remember that was the malt. Mucosa associated lymphoid tissue specific to the gut means gut associated lymphoid tissue. And these will be in clusters called Peyer's patches. 
It's also in the ileum that we're absorbing vitamin B12 as long as intrinsic factor is linked with it. Where did intrinsic factor come from? The stomach? Which cells? Parietal cells. So the parietal cells in the stomach secrete hydrochloric acid. They also secrete intrinsic factor. We need the intrinsic factor when we eat, usually animal products. We'll get vitamin B12, combines with intrinsic factor. Nothing happens until it gets to the ileum and then we'll absorb it. If you do not have enough intrinsic factor, you could eat plenty of B12 and not absorb it at all. The end of the small intestine will terminate at the ileocecal valve. Ileo meaning ileum, that's the small intestine part, Cecum, meaning the part of the large intestine that that food is going to be emptied into. So in this image, we see the terminal portion of the small intestine. So this will be the ileum. We can see where it butts up against the cecum. The cecum is this pouch, which is the first portion of the large intestine. The ileum is where we absorb vitamin B12, only with intrinsic factor from the parietal cells of the stomach. There are Peyer's patches, that are clusters of lymphatic nodules. We're gonna have lymphatic nodules throughout our entire GI tract. So you'll see them on various histology slides. It's just in the ileum, there are several of them bunched together and that's unique to this area. The ileocecal valve is where now the food leaves the ileum, enters the cecum or large intestine. It's important that this ileocecal valve is a one-way valve. The bacterial environment of the small intestine is very different than the bacterial environment of the large intestine. The histology of the ileum is really a lot more thrashed looking, if you will. The villi are not as long and nice as you would find them in the jejunum because most of the absorption has already taken place, so we don't need nearly as much surface area. So as far as the ileum histology goes, you have your basic villi. They're just shorter, a little more tattered generally in these images. And we have Peyer's patches, not in this picture. So the, I point out that out because it's not Peyer's patches throughout the entire portion of the ileum, they're just in patches. So you can see in this image, this is a section where there are clusters of these black circle lymphatic nodules, where the previous slide likely was taken from an area where there were no Peyer's patches. We then have the muscularis externa, circular and longitudinal muscle. The Peyer's patches look like this. If you're doing a scope and you're looking inside the patient, this is what it looks like. If you have the intestine cut open, you can see there's a patch here, another patch here, another one here. So you can see that these patches move, are in isolated areas. And you'll have normal tissue, but then there's just a patch where that, onto the large intestine. The large intestine's main job is to absorb water and vitamins, most of the vitamins. So this is just a small list, but for instance, bile salts, we're recycling some of the bile salts that left through the bile. We're absorbing, for example, vitamin K. Who can recall what medication people take to prevent the absorption of vitamin K and for what purpose? Coumadin, also known as warfarin. What is that for? Who takes Coumadin? It's a pre prevent coagulation. Yep, so if you take a Coumadin, you're blocking vitamin K absorption from the large intestine. Therefore, your liver doesn't have sufficient amount of vitamin K available to make prothrombin. So you're gonna reduce the production of prothrombin and you're gonna reduce the likelihood of creating clots. We also have a few other vitamins. I threw in these ones that are more familiar to you. So the large intestine isn't about absorbing our macronutrients, like our fats and our carbohydrates and our proteins, but it's about absorbing water. It's also here that bilirubin is converted. The bile and the components of bilirubin are broken down further, converted by the bacteria there. It also provides the color to our feces. So if we have varying colors of feces, that can actually indicate a problem. So, you know, don't take for granted that your poop is brown because it could be a different color. And finally, the elimination of waste, anything that's left over, and non-digestible materials. Just because something is not digestible doesn't mean that it's not worth eating. So fiber is one of the examples of something that you put in your body 
and the the fiber provides something for weight to latch onto. So people are focused on fiber, obviously, to think of it as moving the food along, you know, make sure you're not getting constipated, scooching stuff out. But fiber is also a way for waste to bind to it. One example of fiber binding to waste is cholesterol elimination. People rem have reduced cholesterol levels when they consume fiber because when you have your HDL cholesterol, that's our good cholesterol, bringing cholesterol from the periphery back to the liver so we can dump it and get rid of it out of our body, that cholesterol comes out in the bile into our intestine. The jejunum sees it and says, there's some cholesterol, maybe I should absorb it. But if you had fiber there, that cholesterol as a waste will bind to the fiber and be less likely to get reabsorbed and actually carried on out of the body. So non-digestible materials not only can carry out waste, but they feed, if you eat the right ones, feed the bacteria, the good bacteria in our intestines. So non-digestible materials, although you're not getting a nutrient from it, also play an important role in our body's health. So this list looks a little bit daunting, but it's easier than it looks. So we'll go through on the next slide. So how we go is the first part food arrives at is the cecum. This is this pouch-like structure. So some people that have an appendix hanging off the cecum that perhaps isn't all the way tightened up, that maybe has a gap, then fecal matter actually can go in here and doesn't move along and then it festers and rots and then our immune system is all along the walls of this appendix and it's our immune system that, that goes haywire, inflammation, and that you can have an appendix rupture. And that half, the time course of that is very, very quick. So this is an up-close view. You can see where the ileum enters. This would be the ileocecal valve. Then we have the cecum is the pouch below the point of the ileocecal valve. And this is the opening into the appendix in this area. So back to the colon. From the ileocecal valve up, will be the ascending colon. That means the part goes going up. And our large intestine goes up and makes a frame around our abdominal cavity. So we have our ascending colon on the right side moving up. Then that first corner, that right turn, it's known as the right colic flexure, is also known as the hepatic flexure because that's where the liver is. Then we go across as the transverse colon. The transverse colon goes across until we get to the splenic flexure on the left side or known as the left colic flexure. There's that corner. And then descending colon, going straight down. Once we get down, which is just right behind here, it's anterior superior iliac spine, that's the point of that here. So just medial to that is about where our descending colon arrives. Then it's going to curve posteriorly, that kind of goes inferior, posterior, and around. So it kind of makes a little S curve. That's why it's known as a sigmoid colon. And then the last straightaway is going to be the rectum. Then in the rectum, that's where we have our internal and external anal sphincters. The comparison of the internal and external anal sphincters are going to be just the same as what we're going to talk about in the next unit when we talk about the urethral sphincters. What they are, are the difference between the internal and external anal sphincters is the muscle that's involved. So the sphincter is a circular muscle. Internal anal sphincters, as well as the urethral sphincter, is made of smooth muscle. The external sphincters are made of skeletal muscle. Who can tell me the significance of those muscle differences? Excellent, voluntary and involuntary. So the internal one is made of smooth muscle and it's involuntary. So both our rectum, as well as the urethra, has the urethral sphincter, internally smooth muscle is keeping it closed. And so whether it's urine in the bladder or it's feces in the rectum, it's going to be closed all the time until there's a certain point of distinction where it's getting full of, if it's a bladder of urine, if it's you know feces, if it's in the rectum. So it's not like it's just open and it's just coming out all the time. It's closed until a certain point of distension and then it's time to go. And then if you're you know, a kid about one year old or so, you know, earlier, it's just gonna come out. Like it's time to go and then now we let it go. 
the external sphincters are made of skeletal muscles, so you can actually learn to override that opening impulse. So the internal is going to want to open, but you can then go, Oop, I've noticed this, and I'm going to use the external sphincter with control to get to where I need to go to hold it and override it. So that's the whole point of potty training kids is training that external, those external sphincters, anal and urethral sphincters, to override the impulse when they have to go. And then obviously, to find out, to feel, hey, this is coming on. I'm starting to feel some distension. Let me plan ahead and maybe not wait till it's, uh, I gotta go this second. That tends to be the biggest problem. So um, how, so the summary here is internal anal sphincters made of smooth muscle, involuntary external skeletal muscle. That's what potty training does, trains that so you can override it. Internal, external, they're right there together. Tenia coli and haustra are the main features of the large intestine that we see and that we characterize as a large intestine. So small intestine is just a bunch of squiggly smooth tubes. The large intestine is this one. Not only does it frame the abdominal cavity, but we see as this real prominent white stripe going across, that's tenia coli. The stripe, tenia means tension or tense, coli meaning the colon. So it is under some tension. The tension of tenia coli forms these pouches. These individual pouches are known as haustra. And those are what's visually the most characteristic of the large intestine. We have tenia coli is the stripe and the haustra there's a couple of haustra, there's another one. So there are these pouches, sort of randomly select a few. Each of those are a haustra, little pouch area. The histology of the large intestine is we still have the same main layers, the mucosa layer, submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa, you just don't see that here. In fact, you don't see the muscularis externa in this picture either. In this picture, we can see is the mucosa, which is just square. The mucosa goes down, here we have another muscularis mucosa, so that means the orange below that is going to be submucosa. The main thing to notice about the large intestine is it does not have these individual villi like we saw in the small intestine. They're mushed together and there's lots of goblet cells. So we can see tons of these white circles, those are cells making mucus. Because if we're in an area that we're now extracting as much water from the food as we can, we want to keep this food moving forward and so and lubricated, so that's where the mucus comes into play. We add mucus to it to allow it to move along more easily while we're continuing to extract as much water out of that. So if you're looking at a series of histology images, to me, if you just see one and there's just top to bottom, lots of little circles and everything's kind of mushed together, that just is, says large intestine. This is a view of the eight appendix. We can see a normal appendix here and an inflamed appendix that's been taken out before it burst. So that's, we're done with what we have for today for the lecture. What I want you to know for the lecture as a summary is you should know the small intestine, the three regions in the small intestine. You should know what's going on in each region, what the purpose is. You should know histologically the unique features. Duodenum histologically is gonna be unique because of Brunner's glands. The jejunum, pretty simple looking, but so the unique feature would be say longer villi, more numerous, longer villi, so we have greater surface area. Ilium, shorter villi, but we're gonna have the presence of Peyer's patches. Then you should know the function at each point. So the duodenum is going to have Brunner's glands, reduces, sort of buffers the pH, so it brings the pH up so that we don't, we go back up to closer to seven, so we're not at two or to three. It is a site for the gallbladder to dump bile and the pancreas also to dump digestive enzymes. So we're doing a lot of digestive elements in there. That's what we're gonna talk about the next class period. And the jejunum is about absorption, the ileum is about inspection and absorbing vitamin B12, as long as you had intrinsic factor from the parietal cells in the stomach. Then the large intestine, you should just know the basic anatomy of the large intestine and that it absorbs water and vitamins. These are really like the main things that's the job of the large intestine.